just question and answer. You know, you guys have been through about five weeks of this, and then you've had a couple of weeks where I was jammed up in court. And so hopefully you've gotten some disputes sent out. Maybe you're getting some results back. And so just uh, I'd like to know what questions you have. I think we'll see. I think on your questions, you can either do chat like we've been doing the previous weeks, where I think I can invite you sort of onto the stage if you want to be on the video. And just obviously remember you're in front of people. This is not a private conversation. And so, you know, I wouldn't give any, uh, you know, specific details. I mean, you can say, I'm dealing with a credit card or I'm dealing with a credit bureau. You don't have to say it's Capital One and it's Equifax. Um, before we do that, let me mention uh, a couple of things. One, next week, next Thursday, my plan is to do a webinar really about sending dispute letters to debt collectors. So there's basically three types of letters we can send to a debt collector directly. I'm not talking about sending to a credit bureau or anything like that, just directly to the debt collector. And so what are those? How do we combine them? What's the strategy? And uh, then we'll talk also about when do you dispute through the bureaus versus disputing directly to a debt collector? And I want to start talking about something this week. We'll probably finish it next week. And that is a recent case from the 11th Circuit that's just sent shockwaves through the debt collection industry. I mean, they are having a complete, utter meltdown over this case from the 11th Circuit. 11th Circuit is the federal court over Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. And then... Um, really just kind of give you a, a quick review of where where we've been and, and where we are now. So we first talked about we've got to pull our credit reports from annualcreditreport.com. And I know you guys know this. Let me just see here if I can share my screen. And so, you know, this is just annualcreditreport.com. It's the place to go once a week, and you can see that, um, you know, these free weekly credit reports, this is where you get the most information, uh, much more information than you would get from even like myfico.com or SmartCredit or Identity IQ. This is the place to go. And so we start here, we pull our credit reports, and then we dispute the biographical, its name, address, social, date of birth, phone numbers, place of employment. And then we move into if we had a bankruptcy, is that being reported correctly? How about the inquiries? And then we really get into the accounts and two critical things to remember with accounts or what are called trade lines. These are uh, things that furnishers, those who provide or furnish the information to the credit bureaus report on us. It has to be complete and it has to be accurate. If you find it's incomplete, you can dispute. If you find it's inaccurate, you can dispute. And so then we get the results back and we decide, do I need to dispute again? It's pretty uncommon, but sometimes you need to dispute again. Maybe they raise some, like they may fix the bad stuff, but then they raise a new problem. Or if it's not fixed or deleted, then you look at suing these guys. And I wanted to share with you one more thing. If you're not familiar with this, this is a Cornell Law School Legal Information Institute. It's a great place just to find, you know, updated statutes. So the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act. And so, you know, if you are interested in learning more about this, it's always good to go to two places. One, the case law. What do the courts say about it? And then also, what does the actual statute say? So I wanted to share that with you. Okay, guys, uh, this is apparently my fun time for technology here as my internet went out for some reason. So uh, hopefully you can hear me now. And um, let me just, uh, I'll go through a few of these comments and then um, we'll get into some questions about the actual credit reporting. Let's see, uh, Tamla says, I'm a data person. Did you know that the account section is only for credit grantors? So is the other section. I, I'm not exactly sure 
what you mean by that. The, the section that has your accounts or what are called trade lines, uh, those are for users of credit reports. So anybody that looks at a credit report and tons of people look at your credit report every month. And it's also on what is technically called your consumer disclosure, which is when you pull your own credit report. And uh, so that has to be correct or you're allowed to dispute it. And then there's a follow-up question. Why does Midland go on the other section of a report, not collections? That's a bit random. Equifax is sort of all jumbled up. Uh, you just, you do have to look through every section. TransUnion's easy. All the negative accounts are up top and they're in alphabetical order. And then the collection accounts kind of start that over in alphabetical order. Let's see, Jim says, I got an unsigned collection letter from a debt buyer in California. Uh, research signature, see if you had a bar number, nothing found. So the, the bar number would be if this person's claiming to be a lawyer. And now just a debt buyer, you know, they don't have to have a, a bar number. See, Jeff said lost audio and video. Yeah, I don't know why that happened, Jeff. Um, <laughs> but hopefully we're we're back uh, on here. Let's see, Jim said, so the collection letter I mentioned is an offer. My wife opened it by mistake. Can I return this offer? It's original envelope since I don't want to do business with it. It doesn't really matter if you return it or not. You know, they can, if they have the right to collect, they can collect. They send you a letter, whether you open it, don't open it. But, you know, the, the offer is to settle. They were saying, pay us, you know, 500 bucks or 5,000 bucks and we'll settle. If you don't accept that offer, then there's no settlement. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so Ralph says, student loan servicer required to report the account holder. They refuse to give me the name of the holder. So I, I would certainly ask them for that. And uh, if it went into default before the servicer got it, then that servicer is almost certainly a debt collector. And so you can request who actually owns this uh, or who is the holder of the note. So let me just talk about that for a second, because there's a lot of confusion about when well, somebody owns something, do they hold something? Uh, I was trying to see if I had a check around here. So just imagine that, that you wrote me a check, okay? It's a payable to John Watts, you know, $100. Well, if I take that check into the bank and I endorse it, then that's good. Now, what if I take my phone and take a picture of that check and I take that picture in to the bank? Well, they're gonna go, no, 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 that's no good. You have to have the actual instrument, so sometimes called a negotiable instrument actual check. That's what has power, not a photocopy of it, not a scan copy of it. It has to be the actual check. Now, obviously, if you're doing like an electronic deposit, then you agree that this is valid to, to do it electronically. So when we're talking about promissory notes, so like a car loan, student loan, mortgage, all those types of things, there is an original note. And if somebody is suing you on that, then typically they need to physically have possession of that note, okay? Now, I just uh, filed an answer and a counterclaim in a case where they're suing us for a second mortgage and they said, oh, we lost the note. So here's a lost note affidavit that says, hey, we, we can't find the note, but we promise you we're the ones you should pay. Well, there are lots of problems with that. So with the, the student loan, somebody supposedly holds that promissory note. Okay. When I say hold, I mean, they physically have possession of it. And that's a reasonable question to ask, particularly if you've gotten different companies claiming to, you know, be entitled to the money. It just makes sense to ask if you can't get it, then that is something you can use with the credit bureaus to say, Hey, I've requested this. They won't give it to me. I think this is an unreliable company. Get it off. The law is not real good on that, just to be blunt with you, but it does give you a shot there. Let's see. All right, Tamla's talking about Metro 2 standard. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we, we, if you want to reach out to me, we'll, we'll talk online. There's, um, and let me just, for those who don't know this, Metro 2 is the industry standard. It's put out by an organization called CDIA. It's basically 
Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, and Avis. They sort of have created this company. And Metro 2 is not the law. It's the industry standard, okay, which can be helpful sometimes. And so there's a lot of confusion about this. And, you know, we, we get, you know, probably once a week, people reaching out to us about Metro 2. And so, um, Tamil, I'm happy to talk with you. You know, send me an email, uh, sort of explain what you're talking about, and, and we'll take a look at it. Let's see. Um Plaza LLC, this is by Chi, is reported only at TransUnion, nothing at the rest of the agency. So uh, companies do not have to credit report. They can choose to credit report uh, to just Aquifax, just Experian, just TransUnion, just Innovus, just SageStream, whoever they want, or they can do any or all of the above. Okay, so the fact that it's only on one bureau doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means you don't have to worry about it on the others. Now, to some extent, we like it being on multiple bureaus because then we compare. Say, all right, well, TransUnion says I was late in February 2018, but Experian says that I was current. And the other bureau says I was 90 days late. Like, which one is it? So it can give us an advantage to having multiple ones. But if it's just on one, then you look at it and you see what's missing, what looks inaccurate. And what's inconsistent, we talked about that in the fifth session of, of our webinar series. You know, you might find, uh, I'll give you just an example, uh, and I see this pretty frequently with Equifax. They will report what's called the data first delinquency. Equifax or Experian TransUnion should report this. They don't, okay? But that's the date that you first defaulted and you never recovered from it, okay? So... Six months ago, I was late on my Capital One card. Next month, I caught it up. Well, I don't have a date of first delinquency because I, I fixed it. But if I never caught it up, well, then the date of first delinquency would be six months ago when I first missed my payment. So you'll find that on Equifax. And then you look at the payment history. And sometimes you'll see the date of first delinquency compared to the payment history. Payment history says you were current that day. Well, how can I be current if that's the date of first delinquency? And so we can look for these internal errors, these internal inconsistencies. Let's see. Uh, Jim asked, are webinars archived for later reference? Yes. So uh, just email me, Jim. You can just reply back to any of these emails coming to you, and I'll give you the links for all the replays. And uh, David says, bad idea to pursue a lawsuit against student loan servicers, especially plan on going back to school. You know, I haven't noticed any problem as far as going back to school. I mean, you don't want to sue anybody unless you have a valid basis. Uh, but if you have a good claim against them, then, you know, I, I haven't seen anybody have negative effects from that. Uh, let's see, Marie, when you dispute an account with the original creditor, are they required to report the account is disputed to the credit bureau? They are with, with this sort of um, uh, disclaimer, I guess I would say. It has to be what's known as a bona fide or a meritorious dispute. So with the FDCPA, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, we can just say, look, I dispute any debt that you have on me. We don't have to give a reason. If we're not talking about a debt collector, instead we're looking at Fair Credit Reporting Act, we do need to have a basis for that. Okay, so, hey, here's the basis of my dispute. You're missing information. There's contradictory information. It's just flat out wrong. Here's my proof. You know, you say I was late uh, December 2017. Here's my bank statement showing I made the payment. It was accepted. It was never returned. You know, wh whatever the proof is, and then if they don't fix it, at a minimum, they have to mark it as being disputed. Now, we can get into the details, and this, this does get into the weeds of Metro 2, exactly how do they market their different codes. There's a XC code and an XH code and all these different codes. Sometimes you'll see uh, dispute resolve, consumer disagrees, or uh, investigation complete, uh, or just consumer disputes, all different codes, and there's kind of different approaches with that. But in general, they have to mark it as disputed. If they don't, you can file suit on that. Uh, 
you know, you still need to dispute it through the bureaus first, but you've got to be able to show the court that you, again, have a bona fide, a legitimate dispute, a meritorious dispute, or else they won't accept that. So uh, tell me what you guys have run into as far as kind of following our plan, you know, pull your credit reports. Have you looked at your biographical information? Have you found errors on there? Remember, we have sort of a three bucket system, right? The first bucket is this is correct now. My name, address, social, date of birth, phone number, place of employment. Second bucket is it's wrong, but it used to be correct. You know, my name changed after a marriage or 10 years ago, I lived at 123 Main Street or you know, 15 years ago, I worked at McDonald's or whatever it is. The third bucket is this was never correct. My name was never Watts John. OK, uh, my phone number never had a, you know, Oregon area code to it. OK, I never worked at UPS, whatever the situation is. And so that will generate for most people quite a few items of dispute. You know, I'm, it, our typical client, we probably have 15 to 20 incorrect personal items on there. Well, again, you load up that letter and if they do the right thing, the bureaus, they get rid of all that stuff. Perfect. Now it's very clean, you know, and nobody's pulling your report, seeing a phone number from 20 years ago and calling that number. But if they don't fix it, now you have violations. And if you combine that with the accounts that you find errors with, maybe there's five negative accounts and you find three errors with each account. Well, that's 15 sort of disputes, if you will. And let's say they only correct half of those. Well, now you have all that personal information and you have the accounts that they didn't fix. And the, the bureaus love to say, well, it's just an accident. We, we meant to fix that one, but that's the one thing we missed. It's hard to say when there's like a dozen of those, okay? It's like, that was a mistake and that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> yeah, it's not a very good argument for them. So, you know, I'm just curious, have you guys sent out your letters? Are you getting results back? What's going on? Let's see, Jeff said, are collection agencies required to notate an account as being medical collection when they credit report it and we dispute it? Yeah, so typically... Jeff, they would. Um, if the name will give something away, like let's say it's, um, you know, XYZ collector, but the, the original creditor is Smith Cancer Foundation. Well, they'll tend to, to block that, not on your consumer disclosure when you pull your own report, but when anybody else pulls it, they'll sort of block that out and just say medical, okay? so that nobody can understand, you know, hey, this was a, a cancer, this was a, you know, organ transplant or orthopedic or whatever it might be. So uh, the way you've described it, Jeff, is generally the way that they should do it. I see David says, my wife has disputed her six student loans twice now, and they say, okay, up until they report history nine days late than 120 days late. Balance history shows even more errors within the same time period. So uh, student loans are a little strange, uh, particularly federal student loans. Sometimes they do report that way. They they won't do the negative reporting until 90 days. OK, now I still think it's a valid basis to dispute because it does say, OK, OK. And then 90 days late, it's like, how did I get 90 days late when I was OK? Let them come in and try to explain that. OK, but on the balance history, like I just did sent out some disputes the past couple of days where, you know, we have a balance of, you know, $9,000 and then 8,700 and says zero payment. And then 8,400, zero payment, 8,300, zero payment. It's like, well, what's happening here? Okay. So definitely look at that history. Look at the rating, you know, okay, 30, 60, 90, 120, all that type of stuff. Look at the status and you're really just, kind of zeroing in on, let's say, your TransUnion report. Let me see everything that's wrong here. Then you look at your experience. Then you look at your Equifax. I find it easier if you first sort of copy and paste everything to a spreadsheet, and then you can really see kind of the big picture of what's wrong and then just identify every error that you see on there. That's my suggestion. 
Let's see. Uh, David says two times disputing, finally put on all inquiries as well. Some personal information changed, have incorrect items still. You know, David, if you want to uh, reach out to me, if you want to send me your dispute letter and then the results that came back, and I'll be glad to, to look at those for you. Let's see. Marche, hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, says double reporting creditor list on credit report account closed written off sold to collection now collection updated regularly along with original creditor updating accounts charged off how can i stop this double whammy so let me make sure i understand let's just sort of make up some names here let's say it's capital one and they say charged off uh, sold to another lender and portfolio recovery is on there so you can have capital one the original creditor and portfolio recovery the debt collector, the debt buyer, they can both be on your credit report, but they don't both need to be updating. Certainly there's only one balance. Okay. That would be not on capital one. It would be on portfolio recovery. But if capital one is updating every month saying charge off, then that's a problem. I will say this, if you're disputing it, then you're sort of making them update. OK, and so sometimes that can lead to them updating on a monthly basis. They still shouldn't be doing it, but sometimes that happens. So um, I would say just you know make sure you're looking at your your actual credit reports. Again, smart credit has its place. Identity IQ has its place, but they just are not particularly accurate. OK, and it's fine to just, you know, if we're doing like sort of credit repair, just trying to get some things off. But if you're setting it up for either they fix it or you sue, you really need to have your real reports. And if you are still seeing all this, feel free again, just email me back. You should have an email from me and, uh, you know, just include that sort of give me a, an idea of what's going on. So <laughs> reason I say, give me an idea. People will send me, you know, like a 150 page Equifax report and say, can you take a look at this? I'm like, Well, wh what do you want me to look at? You know, so say, Hey, it's the Capital One on page 74 and the portfolio on page you know, 96. And then that will kind of let me get my bearings. Let's see, Chi said, I sent certified letter to credit collector since May 25th challenging the debt. How long do I have to wait before I can take action? So uh, if you sent a dispute letter directly to the collection agency, and you say, look, I dispute this debt, or if you do it the way we recommend, and we'll talk about this next week, it'll be all about doing dispute letters directly to the collector. Then we say, I dispute any debt that you claim to have on me because I don't want to write down the wrong account number, okay? And they may have an account I don't even know about. So if you do that, then the question is, when do they update it? So I'm suing a company think they got our, so let, let me just share the story with you. It was a, a dispute letter that said, hey, I dispute this debt and I refuse to pay any debt, okay? So within seven days, a letter came back from the collection agency say, you do owe this debt. We deem this to be frivolous. Here's the proof. You better call us and pay. Well, they just violated the law on what's called the cease communication. So if we go back to, let me see if I can share the screen here. If we go back to the 1692C, then we drop down to C. So it's CC, okay? Ceasing communication. So you have to notify them in writing that you refuse to pay a debt or that you wish them to cease communication. They shall not communicate further. And then there's few exceptions. So in that particular case, uh, they they violated that part of the law, and then they updated the credit report, and they marked it as, uh, or did not mark it as disputed. So to answer your question, how long do you have to wait? You really need to see, okay, they, they got it, I'm assuming we say May 25th, that's when they received it, or whenever they received it, you know, by certified mail, you can tell when they received it. Then do they update after that and do they mark it? Typically, this is in the remarks or the comments. It'll say consumer disputes or disputed by consumer. So I wouldn't sue if they get it on one day and then the next day they update. But if it's enough period of time, 
then you know you should be good to go to look at suing them. Doesn't mean you should sue them. You know, maybe a twenty thousand dollar collection account. Well, by suing them, they may counter sue you. So there's got to be some good judgment. I don't recommend anybody do these without a lawyer. There's just it's kind of foolish to do that. First of all, if you get a lawyer who knows what he or she is doing, they're going to make it much more valuable. And our fees get paid by the bad guys. So, you know, there, there's no reason to do it on your own. Uh, but that's the answer. And again, we'll talk about that more next week. And let's see. Yeah, so Tamla is just talking about the data fields. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that, um, Tamla, because they're, Again, it's an interesting thing about Metro 2, and um, I find that a lot of people are a little confused by it. I'm not saying you're confused by it, but I'm saying a lot of people are confused by it. And there are a lot of people out there teaching on this and selling courses, and they literally have zero idea of what they're talking about. They've never been in a lawsuit. They've never taken a deposition of somebody from the bureaus or somebody from CDIA. They've never stood in front of a federal judge talking about Metro 2. It's like they've just read a few things or they heard at a seminar. And, you know, there, there's a big difference between those things. So let's see. Alana says, I sent a letter to a creditor to validate the debt. They sent a copy of the original signed contract. Debt's been sold at least six times. It's over seven years. Numerous errors. Cannot seem to get this on my account. So the uh, let, let's talk about that. So I'm assuming when you say to a creditor, you mean to a debt collector since it's been sold a bunch of times. So uh, the seven years, that's significant for a couple of reasons. One, there's a time period to sue you. That's the statute of limitations that typically runs from when you stop making a payment. Now, it can get a little complicated. OK, but just because a debt, let's say statute of limitations is six years in your state. That doesn't mean just because a debt is more than six years old, they can't sue you. I mean, think about every mortgage is typically 30 years. It's six years after you breach the contract. Now, for credit reporting purposes, it's basically seven years from that date of first delinquency that we talked about, which, again, is the date that you first fell behind and never recovered. So if this is more than seven years from when you defaulted, then it should be off of your credit report. So I would just look at it carefully again. I don't know if I probably sound like a broken record, but make sure you're looking at your real reports, you know, from annualcreditreport.com. And uh, if it is too late, in other words, if it's reporting on your credit report when it should not be, then that is a major, major violation of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So if you want to take a look at that, send it to me by email. I'm glad to take a look at it. Let's see. Sean says, I just filed a CFPB complaint for my Naviant student loans against Burroughs. They have me 90 days late. My loans were in deferment, submitted the deferment information. They still didn't update. Okay. So let me ask you about that, Sean. So when you were in deferment, at the moment you entered deferment, were you current? Were you late? In other words, sometimes we can fall behind and we say, hey, I need a deferment. They say, okay, we'll defer. There's at least an argument they can make that it should keep the same status. In other words, the 90 days late. So, and I know what you're talking about doesn't have anything to do with the, the CARES Act from last year because of COVID, but it, it illustrates what I'm talking about. The CARES Act says if you get what's called an accommodation from any furnisher, I don't care if it's a card company, a payday loan, a mortgage company, it doesn't matter, credit card, anybody. They give you an accommodation. They say, hey, skip a payment, pay a dollar, pay half your normal payment, uh, whatever they say. Your status when you get that accommodation has to be reported all the way through. OK, so let's say you get it right here. It's going forward in time. They must keep that status until the accommodation ends. OK, and so that would be my first question. You know, now, if you were uh, in deferment and you never had to make payments, like let's say that you were supposed to make payments in uh, April 2019. But in April, they said, we'll give you a six month deferment. And then they report you in May 30 days late. June 60, July 90, 
yeah, that's a problem. And you'd want to send them the proof. Sounds like you've done that. And uh, that would need to be updated or somebody needs to be getting sued on that. And Naviant certainly is a company that's very well uh, acquainted with being sued for breaking the law. So uh, just, you know, kind of carefully study that, go back to create a timeline, you know, maybe start in January, 2019. And, and whether you do this by hand, do it on a spreadsheet, basically it's like, okay, this month, January, did I have a payment due? If I did, did I make the payment? All right, February, did I have a payment due? Did I make a payment? March, you know, and just sort of carry that all the way through and then compare that with the reporting and get the proof. That sounds like you have at least some of that, proof, but you just want to document everything that you possibly can. And, you know, it may be that you need to do another dispute and maybe your one dispute was good enough. You know, um, you know, if you have questions about that, just let me know. All right. So Ralph says uh, New York state resident disputed a collection with CRA and the collection agency collection agency then report same collection under a Washington address instead of deleting it. So follow up disputing to the collection address to both CRA and collection agency provide proof. This is potentially two separate lawsuits. So um, it, it may be. Okay. So uh, let me mention this Ralph. Sometimes, well, let me give you a, a normal situation. So um, here's our typical Fair Credit Reporting Act case. We dispute to the three bureaus and they don't fix something with one furnisher. Okay. So we could bring, you know, a lawsuit against Equifax, then a different lawsuit against Experian, another one against TransUnion, another one against Furniture. We typically don't do that. We could bring one lawsuit against all three bureaus and then a separate lawsuit against the furnisher. Again, we typically don't do that. I typically put them all together because the credit bureaus are going to blame the furnisher, the collection agency. Collection agency is going to blame the credit bureau. And what I want to do, and we file these in state court, which I can explain that if anybody's interested, they all end up in federal court. So I want to end up at a federal trial, just kind of, you know, sitting back at the, the council table, you know, not literally with popcorn, but, you know, just kind of like watching this. Okay. These guys are yelling at these guys, yelling at them. And I'm just saying, jury, I don't care who pays the money. Okay. <laughs> like the, the collection agency says the bureaus are at fault. The bureaus say the collection agency's at fault. Well, obviously at least some of them are at fault, maybe all of them. And so I like them kind of shooting at each other. Uh, but oftentimes you can split them up and occasionally there are some advantages to that. So hopefully that answers your question. If it didn't, just let me know. Uh, let's see, Sean says, waiting on the CFPB. Yeah, and, and just a heads up, uh, I'm not a big CFPB, you know, fax a complaint in, uh, but a group I'm in on uh, Facebook mentioned some of the guys that do that a lot say that they've shut down the fax number now. I don't know if that's true. I, you know, you could still file an online complaint with CFPB, but, you know, people got to where they were always faxing stuff and they're like, well, I'm not going to do a dispute to TransUnion. I'll just fax it to the CFPB and then they'll give it to TransUnion. I'm not a fan of that. I think that's dangerous to do, but um, apparently they've shut down the, uh, the fax number now. Let's see. Uh, Pandora says, I've sent biographical request update letters and had TransUnion do this immediately. Equifax took some push changes after a few times. Experience just ignoring, not updating. So uh, pretty typical. I, I, you know, I see TransUnion all the time. OK, I'm suing them. Probably have like four lawsuits already lined up this month against TransUnion. Uh, but I will say this, they typically do a good job. Even if you do it online, they will get rid of that out of date or incorrect information. Equifax, you know, a little bit better. Experian is notorious for this, particularly addresses. What Experian will, will send back to you, and Pandora, I'm, I'm curious if this is exactly what you got. They'll send back a letter that says, um, we see that you're disputing your name, your address, whatever. This has been provided to us by a furnisher and we invite you to contact the furnisher 
to discuss this with them, or you can call us to discuss it. Well, first of all, it's not my job to like figure out which furnisher put which address. Okay. The, let me go back to our sharing the screen and just show you this. So if we go to 1681I, which I stands for investigation, that's how I think of it. So we've got reinvestigations of disputed information. It's called reinvestigation because theoretically every credit bureau investigates the information before they ever report it. It's a little bit of a fiction. But if you look at this, it says if the completeness or accuracy of any item of information contained in a consumer's file. Well, the consumer file is what they produce, even though it's not all of it, but we'll just sort of go with this for the sake of discussion. The credit report that a user gets or your consumer disclosure is your credit file, okay? And so anything in there, you can challenge the accuracy of that. Well, if your name's in there, is that anything? Yep, that's anything. If your date of birth is in there, is that anything? Yeah. You know, we only challenge stuff that is incorrect, okay? But experience says, uh, we're not going to investigate it. You, you got to go call some people. Or maybe you can call us, and then we'll give you a name and a number, and you can call. No. I mean, I just sue Experian for that. If you've made it very clear this is what's happening, and they refuse to do it, refuse to investigate that biographical stuff, I mean, I like to have something else. You know, here's a wrong account that they refuse to uh, correct or delete or, you know, I like to have something besides the biographical, but I will sue just on the biographical because to me, it's outrageous what Experian is doing on this. And uh, matter of fact, a friend of mine just filed a class action against Experian on this. Now, personally, I'm not a huge fan of class actions. I think you get much better results doing it yourself in an individual case, but there are some, you know, benefits overall to those who sort of won't, you know, take action on their own. But, uh, you know, if experience sending you that letter that I described, I would certainly look at suing them. Let's see. Jim says, um, just, here we go. All right. A dead buyer sued me last year in court. I was bumfuzzled in the courtroom. No evidence was presented. Judgment was awarded to a debt buyer. Since then, I have an arbitration award against a debt buyer, but unable to collect because a federal court in the venue of the arbitration will not certify the arbitration award. They will not obey the FAA. How can I get certification? Jim, my question to you is, what arbitration did you go through? And let me explain. There's two major arbitration associations. There's AAA, American Arbitration Association, and there's one called JAMS, J-A-M-S. Those are legitimate. If you get an award through those, then those can be, uh, you can take those really to any court. Uh, there are people, we'll say maybe they even had good intentions, and then some had terrible intentions, but people have set up sort of these bogus arbitration forums where they say, hey, come to us, we'll arbitrate the case, we'll give you an award, and the courts go, yeah, that's that's garbage, okay? It used to happen on the other side. There was something called NAF. This is, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago where all these credit card companies, particularly MBNA, which is sort of part of Bank of America, they, they would do these bogus arbitrations and get judgments against, against people, and those got shut down. OK, because it was just garbage. It wasn't a real arbitration. And so, Jim, that would be my question. Where did you get that arbitration award from? Did you go to AAA? Did you go to JAMS or was it somewhere else? And if it was somewhere else, that might explain why the court is not willing to basically enforce that arbitration award. Let's see, Tam said, do you do class suits? I have over the years. Um, not for most things I'm not a big fan of. Now, if, if the damages to each person are small, then that makes sense. But, you know, I'm not going to do a class where each class member gets like $37, where if I represent them individually, I could get them $1,000 or $50,000 or $100,000. Uh, 
Um, as far as where I work, I practice in Alabama. Now, you know, we can represent people in other states, depending on who we're suing, we can file the suit in Alabama. We can also, uh, we're brought in in other states, uh, particularly as lawyers get closer to trials. Uh, they may bring us in to help them try the case. And so uh, that, you know, it's really anywhere in the country on that. Let's see, Sean says, if you're disputing derogatory items, is it a violation of the CRAs to update? So it, it, it's not a violation to update that account. So I'm disputing my Capital One account. Um, it updated on you know May the 10th. I dispute it. I get the results back on June the 10th, and it says, or mailed out on June the 10th, and it says updated June 10th. That's fine. The question really is, is the information correct or is it incorrect? If it's correct, then it's fine for them to update it. If it's incorrect and they update it with the incorrect information, that's when we sue them. So hopefully that's helpful. Let's see, Pandora says, found annual credit reports different than what is directly on the credit bureau's reports. I only notice this because I have free accounts and why I check the weekly report. What do you do at this point? Verify accuracy. So yeah, it's a great point, Pandora. So let's, let's take a step back. In a perfect world, Equifax would be the same as Experian, would be the same as TransUnion. Of course, if that was the case, we wouldn't need three different bureaus. But then in a even an imperfect world, you would expect your paper copy from Equifax to be the same as myequifax.com, to be the same as Equifax that you pull off annual credit for. Often there are differences. Sometimes it's subtle differences. And it could be, I, I pulled my annual credit report through Equifax today. I get a paper copy tomorrow in the mail, but really it was dated a week ago. And myequifax.com is dated, you know, tomorrow when I pull it. Uh, but you can certainly use those discrepancies. Okay, so if you're using our spreadsheet that we suggest, you know, they're sort of horizontally would be, this is my Equifax report dated, you know, June the 2nd. 2021. Well, the next line below it may be, you know, my Equifax.com report. Next line may be Equifax paper report dated May 31st. And you can find discrepancies. So, you know, we're looking for discrepancies inside of one credit report, even inside of one company's credit report. So, hey, Equifax, on my paper copy, you say this, but on my Equifax.com, you say this. In annual credit report Equifax, you say this, which one's true. But then we're also expanding that to say, TransUnion, you say this, Experian this, Equifax, something else. And so just look for all those discrepancies. And it's frustrating, okay, that you have to do this, but just think of it as opportunities to challenge negative accounts when you find these types of errors on there. So we just have to kind of reframe our mind to say, look, this is ridiculous that there are all these different versions, but hey, I'm going to use those and point out to Equifax, hey, you have multiple different versions. You tell me, guys, which one is true. Let's see. Sean says, yes, I was in deferment the whole time. 90 days was within a 30-day fine. Yeah, Sean, if you will, uh, send me that information. I'd like to see what they're doing and see if I can figure out a, you know, an explanation for why they're doing that. Uh, Jeff says, yes, we'd like your logic filing cases in state court. Is it called federal preemption when defendant has it removed? Why not just file in federal court at the beginning? Okay, so this is something that is more, uh, you know, for lawyers, but uh, if you're going to be hiring a lawyer, uh, it's certainly something to raise with the lawyer. Okay, and let me check my time. I've got a call at, at 1.30 my time. So I've got about 19 minutes here. So here's the deal. And, and I apologize that this will be boring some people, but just I got to go through a few things. If you file directly in federal court, there's this issue called standing. And you remember when we looked at this Hunsting case, that was my reminder that I have a call, uh, looked at this Hunsting case, uh, they talked about let me, uh, this Article 3 standing, if you can see this here. I'm not sure how well it's showing up, but 
Article three standing. Um, oh, sorry. Here we go. Yeah. Article three standing. And, and that is the idea. You have to have what's called a concrete injury for the doors of the federal courthouse to open. So what's happened is the federal judges have gotten more and more strict about this. So what two years ago would be sufficient for the doors to open, there'll be a new opinion. Last year it says, nope, nope, that's not sufficient. You get thrown out. So I had a case, a Fair Credit Reporting Act case. We filed it in federal court. We're at pretrial. So we're picking out jury instructions. We're talking about exactly how long the trial is going. And one of the lawyers raised his hand and said, uh, we're going to make a Spokio challenge, which is Spokio is sort of the leading case on this standing issue. And and the idea is that if the court doesn't have standing, the court has no jurisdiction, no power, nothing the court does means anything. So the court has to look at that even at that late date. So what they did is they tried to get our case thrown out early on. We were successful. We go through depositions. They thought they were going to get what's called summary judgment where the judge throws it out. Judge denied it. They realized they're going to trial. They're facing punitive damages. They're like, uh-oh, no standing. And because if they could get the case thrown out, then we're out of court. And frankly, the statute of limitations would have expired. So we can't even go sue in state court. So, you know, when that happened, I said to myself, I will never file another case in federal court. So we file in state court. So imagine this is state court over here. They then remove it to federal court. As long as there is a federal claim and there's something else, but all of our cases that we're talking about in this webinar would be federal claims like the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So they remove it. Well, when they remove it, then they're so locked into this standing Spokio thing. You know, I get these, these long emails, John, we're going to have you sanctioned because you don't have standing in this because of Spokio. And you don't have a concrete injury, which is bogus. And so they send me this really long email threatening and, you know, you better dismiss this case and beg us for forgiveness. And, and I write back, I say, so you agree to remand, which means it started off state court, it's here in federal court because it was removed to federal court. Remand just says, send it back to state court. I go, so you're good with remanding it? That's like the only thing I say. And then I get, oh, sorry, I, I forgot we removed it. I'm like, yeah, genius, you forgot you removed it. So we do it in state court. So when they take us to federal court, which actually I'm fine either, you know, state court or federal court. When we get to federal court, we don't have to worry about this Spokio thing because if they raise it, I go, fine, let's go back to state court. Let's have a jury trial in Alabama state court, or maybe we're in Georgia or some other state. Let's have a jury trial in state court. And then they start like panicking and having a meltdown. And they go, oh, 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 forget it, forget it, forget it. We're not, we, we don't want challenge standing. And so uh, that's the reason we bring these in state court. There's a few other things, but that's really the biggest reason. And, you know, lawyers on the other side will ask me, John, why do you always file these in state court? You know, we're removing them to federal court. I go, well, maybe you'll forget. And they go, we'll never forget. I go, okay. But this way, I never have to hear the words come out of your mouth about Spokio or standing. Because as soon as you do that, I'm going to say, so you ready to go back to state court? And there'll be sort of this pause. I go, okay. Yeah, I, I get that. So anyway, that's why we do it. Let's see, Jim says, I'm sure the credit card companies have their own arbitrators, closed loop system against the debtor. Well, the, the good thing about AAA and JAMS is those are legitimate places. And let me tell you what, you know, we can beat the absolute daylights out of these people in JAMS, particularly and in AAA. Um, just give you an idea. Um, if we go if we force somebody into arbitration and of course their contract will say they can force us into it, which means we can force them into it. So let's say I've got a, um, uh, my, my internet provider, you know, AT&T has just been garbage, right? They keep shutting down and they won't fix it. And I file an arbitration claim against them. Well, to get through that claim may cost them four grand just in fees they're paying to the arbitration association. When we go with jams, which is a much sort of, uh, you know, I'll just say it this way. 
it's much more expensive. Okay. So when we do like a two day arbitration, then they're typically paying the arbitrator ten, fifteen thousand dollars for that. Okay. Uh, there's other costs involved too. Okay. My point is it's very expensive for them and there's really no appeal. So I'll, I'll share this story with you. This is from many years ago. Uh, we had a small company suing a big company and there was an arbitration agreement and they got the judge to force us into arbitration. It's called compelling arbitration. And so we took it up to the Alabama Supreme Court and they said, nope, you got to arbitrate. So I said, fine. So we go arbitrate it. And at the end of the arbitration, we got a seven figure award. Okay. And they thought it should be no more than a hundred thousand. Well, we got seven figure. They just had this come apart. I mean, they were just kicking and screaming. They go back to the same judge that they begged to send us to arbitration. They go, judge, judge, you got to fix this. This arbitrator is actually a panel. They were wrong. They gave too much money. And, and we need you to protect us now. And the judge is just up there laughing at them, literally laughing. He's like, boys, you want me to throw you in that briar patch? You got to live with it now. And he just stamped it and said, go collect on your, you know, multi-million dollar verdict, uh, arbitration award. So th these, these companies use arbitration because they don't want class actions against them and they don't want juries. But to do that, they have to almost bend over backwards and make these very fair where they pay virtually all the expenses of arbitration, which gets very expensive. And so we bring these claims and then they start going, well, this is unfair that we're in arbitration. I'm like, hey, genius, you wrote the contract. You know, this is your problem. So just understand you can take them to, if you have a legitimate claim, take them to AAA, take them to JAMS, whatever the contract says. And, you know, a lot of times you can get good results there. Let's see, Anthony says, uh, do you have any more information about Cornell Law School about reinvestigation? Well, it's really just um, if you go to that website, it's called law.cornell.edu. Uh, it's just a good place to look up statutes and things of that nature. So uh, David said it's frustrating, but as many opportunities to get stuff right. Yeah. And I think, David, you're talking about those sort of multiple versions of your credit report. And um, Pandora said, can you share a refuse to pay or cease communication letter template here? Having a hard time verifying the debt with Calvary after request for debt validation. So here's the thing, uh, Pandora, I, I will have some stuff that I can pass out next week, but I, I just want you to understand conceptually. And, and what you're doing, I think is really the best way. Like you go to Calvary, you say, give me validation, give me proof. Okay. So what we always ask for is copy of the contract. If this is like a credit card and Calvary typically is, we want the monthly statements from when it was last at zero to whatever the charge off amount is. Okay. So if they say, John, you owe $5,432 and, you know, 10 cents. Okay, great. Show me the statement at zero and every statement after that. So I can see how I built up to $5,432 and 10 cents. Okay. And then we say, Hey, if you say you purchased the debt, give me proof, give me the purchase agreement. They never give us that stuff. So then it's natural to come back to them and say, hey, guys, I, I still dispute any debt that you have on me. And because you won't give me the proof I've requested, I refuse to pay any debt to you guys, period. Put your name, your address, last four of your social date of birth, and you're done. So there, there's nothing really magical about it. It's just that's a logical way to do it. Because first you go and you ask for information. If they don't give it, you say, hey, because you didn't give me the information, now I'm telling you I refuse to pay. Let me tell you what often happens. They get that letter and they write you back, go, well, here it is. Well, let's go back to our uh, code section here. And again, we'll cover this in more detail uh, next week. But if we go back to 1692C, which is communication, so the cease communication, again, notice what it says. If you, well, I'm good to highlight. If you refuse to pay the debt or you tell them you wish them to cease communication. Now, 
sometimes people will say, well, I demand that you cease calling me, only write me. That's not a cease communication. Okay, you can't pick and choose. Now, if the rules change in November, we can do that, but not right now. It's either cease all communications or there is no cease communication. But refuse to pay and cease communication, those are one and the same. Okay, it's like saying six or one half dozen. It literally, it's the same thing. The debt collector, if you do that, debt collector shall not communicate further except to tell you, hey, we're not doing anything or we may invoke some remedies, like we may sue you if they do that, or to notify that they intend to invoke a specific remedy, like, you know, we we could uh, credit report or we could sue you. We are going to sue you. They can tell you that. Other than that, they can't talk to you. So if they send you proof and say, now you can pay, they just violated that. So Pandora, hopefully that is helpful to you. And again, if you can come back next week, um, you know, I'll, I'll put the, um, I'll send out an email to everybody. Hey, here's the link to sign up for it. And then uh, it'll also be on our YouTube channel and, and we'll talk about it in more detail, but it, it's really just a logical thing to say, I asked you for proof. You refused to give it to me. So I refuse to pay you. Thank you. And now we're done. Okay. Now you can start off that way. Okay. So you don't have to kind of do the two-step approach. You can just immediately, you get a collection letter, you get a collection call, you see something on your credit report. You could send them a refuse to pay letter just out of the gate. Um, it's not my favorite tactic, but you can do that. Okay. And then what you're watching for is, do they mark your account as disputed on your credit report? Do they update it after they got your letter? Do they mark it as disputed? If they did not, that violates section E8. And let me just, uh, this will be the last thing. I will share this with you. So if we go to section E, this is false or misleading representation. So this part tells us debt collector may not use any false, deceptive, or misleading representation. And then this will give us examples. If we go down to eight, so this is known as an E8 violation, Communicating or threatening to communicate to any person credit information which is known or which should be known to be false. Now, then they give us an example, including, so let me just highlight this, including the failure to communicate that a disputed debt is disputed. So when you send a dispute letter or you send a refuse to pay letter, you send a validation letter, as long as you say, hey, I dispute this debt, when they update your report, if they don't mark it as disputed, boom, that's a violation. You send a refuse to pay letter, and then they start communicating with you, except for those few exceptions we look at, that's a violation. Sometimes they do both just because they want you to hammer them twice, okay? So again, we'll talk about all this next week. And uh, let's see, Nicole is giving me the, yes, thank you, Nicole. <laughs> so uh, I will have to hop off here. And um, let's see, can you put the website on the screen? Yeah, so Anthony, uh, let me just... I'll put this in the comments. Hopefully you can see this, but um, if you can just see kind of up here, it's just www.law.cornell.edu. But really, if you just, it literally, if you type in like, you know, FDCPA section 1692E, this most likely will be one of your first things. Like, let me, uh, let me just go to incognito so it's not... Um, well, for some reason, that's not popping up. But anyway, you know, mine, I, I use this a lot. So it comes up a little bit uh, more often. And, um, yeah, I'll put this in as well. Uh, but if you just Google, like, FDCPA Section 1692C or Section 1692E, most likely you'll come up with this. And there are other places you can get the law. I just like this. It seems to be up to date. Uh, let me just show you, like when we're here, it's pretty easy to go to the next section or to up here to kind of get the big picture. So here's the FDCPA. These are all the sections of it. And I just like the way it's organized. I think it's pretty good. So, well, listen, guys, uh, I will look forward to seeing you all next week. Um, again, apologize. The last couple of weeks just completely jammed up in trials. 
And um, so the jury trial in federal court supposed to be doing that on Monday. We settled that. So I actually have kind of some room to breathe for a moment. And uh, I'm sure I'm behind on some emails. I'll try to see those. But if if I've uh, if you've sent me an email, I haven't responded. Just if you don't mind, send it again, and I will try to catch those up this weekend. Uh, also, I will be at a, a seminar uh, the first part of next week called Credit Con. It's uh, mainly uh, folks in the credit repair space. And uh, I'm doing a presentation there with some other lawyers. And then there'll be some people there that, you know, will have some interesting presentations. And so uh, that'll be Monday through Wednesday. But uh, in the evenings, I'll try to check my email some as well. And uh, you guys have a fantastic rest of your Thursday. And I will see you guys next week. Okay. Have a good one. Bye-bye.